Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. So today we are going to be covering part two of the long beard, the female long beard, Bell Gunness. So stay tuned and find out what is in today's video. Okay guys, so like I said in the intro, we're going to be covering part two of the female longbeard Belle Gunness. Now in part one, we learned about her early life and her early troubles, and we have gone into her first marriage along with the first mysterious issue around Belle Gunness with the fire at the shop. So today, let's just kick off from where we left from, but before we do that, if you like this kind of video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and ring that bell so that you guys are notified every single time I upload a video. So we're going to move on. Part 2, between 1896 and 1898, the Sorensen family grew by four more children, Caroline, Myrtle, Axel, and Lucy. It was never, class of, uh, it was never clarified whether the children were Mads and Bellas by birth or by adoption. However, two of the children died soon after their birth. Caroline died at five months old and Axel at three months old. Caroline died from entero enterocolitis, which is the acute inflammation of the bowels, and Axel died from hydrocephalus, which is commonly called water on the brain. Some sources say that both children were insured and at the time they died, there were no really suspicions due to the high infant mortality rate. So insurance companies paid out. Friday, October 1st of 1897, Angus Ralston visited the Sorensons presenting himself as the agent and chief engineer for the Yukon Mining and Trading Company. Ralston told the Sorensons that the company was hiring miners to do a year-long stretch in Alaska to possibly strike it rich. Bella, who was always obsessed with money, urged Matts to sign the formal contract. The contract was signed, witnessed, and sealed on October 27th of 1897. The document stated, quote, go to Alaska in the empty, in the employ, I can't read my own handwriting, go to Alaska in the employ of the Yukon Mining and Trading Company and prospect for gold, locate same, and do any other kind of work that the manager in charge of the expedition requires done for one year beginning April 1st of 1898. So Mads would go to Alaska to mine for gold. For this, Mads would be paid, quote, the same wages as other men in the camps were the mines in the company in the camps were and the mines that are located would all he would also receive a one quarter interest of all the mines located by him and two thousand eight hundred shares of stock in the corporation. So he's supposed to go to the mines, he'd be paid what the miners get paid, but if he located any mines, he would own a quarter of that mine and then he would also get stock. On top of this payment plan that was insured for Mads, Bella would receive $35 a month because the breadwinner of the family, be it Mads, would be away from home for a year. The Sorensons immediately went out to get, quote, supplies for one year. To afford this, the couple signed a promissory note on their home. Two months passed from the signing of the contract, the couple never heard from the representative and hired an attorney to, quote, demand the right to examine the books of said corporation. So the following information is going to come from their actual formal lawsuit against the Yukon Mining and Trading Company. 
quote, in compliance with said contract, Matt Sorensen made all preparations and at great sacrifice and expense to himself to go to Alaska and present himself to said company on or about the day of April 1st of 1898 and informed the officers of said corporation that he was ready to fulfill his contract and would hold himself in readiness to go to Alaska. So obviously there was a problem since he didn't hear from anybody. Through the investigation, it was determined that the Yukon Mining and Trading Company had, quote, absolutely no financial resources. June of 1898, the Sorensons filed the following, quote, said corporation had not and has not any interest of any value in any mines in New Mexico, Alaska, or elsewhere. It is absolutely without means, and it has given away large blocks of stock, to wit, 525,000 shares. Its officers and promoters are men without means and men who are not financially responsible. It was formed for the sole purposes of defrauding innocent investors and never at any time intended to fulfill its contract. It is now entirely defunct, insolvent, and abeyant with no assets or means to pay the legitimate debts or to continue in business. Through the lawsuit, the Sorensons were able to save their home, but this incident led Bell to another get rich scheme. On Tuesday, April the 10th of 1900, a fire broke out in the Sorensen home. It is reported to have started by a, quote, defunct heating apparatus. Now, the Sorensen suffered a loss of approximately $650 worth of what they called household goods, and all the property destroyed was insured. And this was reported on by the Chicago Tribune. So here we go. We have yet another mystery fire surrounding Bella. In 1900, the census was performed, and on June 13th of 1900, the U.S. Census in Chicago reported the Sorensen family as Bella, mother of four children, of whom only two were living, Myrtle A, three, and Lucy B, one. There was also an adopted 10-year-old girl who was identified at the time as Morgan Couch, but who was actually Jenny Olson. So, at this time, you have Mads, Bella, and three kids. At the time of the fire, Mads was working for a company that provided him with a $2,000 life insurance policy. Now, you have to think this is in the 1800s. $2,000 was worth quite a lot in today's financial money matters. So $2,000 could have been well within tens to twenties of thousands of dollars nowadays or more. That policy was set to expire on July 30th of 1900, but Mads had gone out and gotten a $3,000 life insurance policy that was, to set, that was set to start on the same day. So for one day, he would have two insurance policies active on himself. Monday afternoon, July 30th, 1900. A former boarder, Dr. J.C. Miller, was summoned to the Sorensen home. When Dr. Miller arrived, he found Mads fully clothed, on the bed and dead. The family's physician, Dr. Charles E. Jones, also arrived at the Sorensen home shortly after Dr. Miller. Both doctors asked Bella what had come of Mads, and Bella stated that Mads was suffering from a bad cold and had come home, <coughs> excuse me, from work that morning complaining of a, quote, fearful headache. Bella stated that she gave him a dose of quinine power, and she stated she left Mads in bed to go cook for the children. She stated that she returned to Mads a short time later to check on him, and this is when she discovered he was dead. 
Dr. Miller stated he was thinking, quote, the druggist had made a mistake and given her morphine instead of quinine. So Dr. Miller asked Bella for the quinine powder paper. And Bella stated that she had thrown it away. So with no evidence, and only Bella's word, the two doctors stated that Mads died from a cerebral hemorrhage. Because both life, pol life insurance policies were active at the time of his death, Bella collected on both of them. Now there are varying accounts as to ac actually how much Bella collected. Some say it was 5,000, some say it was 8,500, so somewhere between five grand and 850, uh, 8,500 is what Bella actually collected on the death of Mads. Tuesday, August 2nd of 1900, only three days after Mads' death, Mads did live Anton Sorensen was buried next to his two infant children at the Forest Home Cemetery. Nellie, who is, of course, Bella's sister, had been estranged from the family for years, but she did attend the funeral. And she, rec and she recounted, while I was there, a terrible feeling came over me. I felt just like something was going to happen. Nellie stated that the feeling was so strong that she could not stand up. So, fast forward to November of 1901. Bella sold her home that she had shared with Mads and Bella with her three children, Jenny, Myrtle, and Lucy, in tow moved to LaPorte, Indiana. Again, Bella had changed her name to Belle. Also, within a few months, Belle would no longer be Belle Sorensen. During the early part of her marriage to Mads, the couple had boarded a man by the name of Peter Gunnison. Not Gunnison, Peter Gunnis. I don't know why I'm adding extra words. Peter immigrated to the United States in 1885 from Norway. He stayed for a while, went back and visited Norway, and when he returned, he returned to Minneapolis, Minnesota on June of, in June of 1895. Peter married a woman by the name of Jenny Sophia Simpson, and the couple had a daughter, Swanhild, in 1897. Four years later, Jenny Gunnis died while giving birth to the couple's second daughter. That child is never named in any of the accounts that I have read, so second daughter. After Matt's death, Bella went to Minnesota to visit a cousin, but she made it a point to look up Peter. Since their last meeting, Bella had aged into a coarse and mannish figure. One person described Bella as, quote, fat, heavy-featured woman with a big head covered with a map with a mop. English. With a mop of mud-colored hair, small eyes, huge hands, arms, and a gross body supported by feet grotesquely small. Basically, the only seductive quality Bella had was her 48-acre Indiana farmstead in LaPorte, Indiana. On April 1st, 1902, Peter Gunnis married Bella Sorensen. They married at the First Baptist Church of LaPorte and were married by Reverend George C. Moore. On April 6th of 1902, Peter's seven-month-old daughter, 
the second daughter of his wife, died while in the home alone with Bella. The death was listed as, quote, edemia of the lungs, and the infant's body was shipped to Chicago where she was buried alongside Bella's other infants and her first husband at the Forest Home Cemetery. So, are we catching a running theme yet? Tuesday, December 16th, 1902, at approximately 3 a.m. Bella's neighbor, Swan Nicholson, and his family were awakened by someone sharply rapping on the door. That person turned out to be Bella's adopted daughter, Jenny, who was beating on the door with a stove poker. Jenny stated, quote, Mama wants you to come up. Papa's burned himself. So Swan and his son Albert went to the Gunnis farm where Bella was in the kitchen crying hysterically. Peter was dressed in bed clothes, lying face down on the parlor floor. Swan would later state, quote, laying on his nose and blood on the floor. Swan also stated he, quote, took hold of his arm to feel the pulse and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't give me an answer. So it's only been seven, eight months, and now we have a second dead husband. Dr. Bo Bowell was summoned to the Gunnis Farm. At the time, he got there. He was surrounded by Swan and Albert Nicholson, Jenny, and a hysterical Bella. Bao got on the floor to closely examine Peter, and Bao immediately knew that Peter had been dead for quite a while. He determined this because Peter's body was already going rigid, and there was a substantial wound on the back of his head that was caked with blood. Bao also documented that Peter's nose was broken so badly that it was bent to one side, and Bao immediately believed that Peter had been murdered. From his discussion with the hysterical Bella, Bao received the following story. Peter had gone into the kitchen to get his shoes that were kept near the stove to keep them warm, and Bella told the doctor that as Peter was bent over, the meat grinder fell from the shelf over the stove and struck him on the back of the head. She also stated that a large bowl of hot brine was turned over on his neck, burning Peter. Bella said that Peter told her he was fine and laid down to rest. A few hours later, Bella found Peter dead. Albert Nicholson, quote, remarked that he thought Mrs. Gunnis had been, mur that he thought Mr. Gunnis had been murdered. His father cautioned him not to say anything of the sort, or there might be trouble for Mrs. Gunnis. In his report, Dr. Bow reported that he found no evidence of scalds or burns on the entire body. Peter's nose was lacerated and broken, showing evidence of severe blows or the result of falling upon a blunt article such as the edge of a board. Most significant wound Peter suffered was a laceration through the, through the scalp and external layer of skull about an inch long situated just above and to the left of the occipital protuberance. Back of the bone, back of the head, that bone right back there, which tap on. Upon removing the precranium, there showed a fracture and depression of the inner plate of the skull and a point corresponding to the external laceration. There was also marked internal cranial hemorrhage. The conclusion Dr. Bow came to was, quote, death was due to shock and pressure caused by fracture and said hemorrhage. But it's still suspicious. So an inquest was held on the death of Peter Gunnis on Tuesday, December the 18th of 1902. The Gunnis farm 
was the scene of said inquest. Matter of fact, it was held in the parlor in which Peter died. Can you get more creepier than that? Dr. Bow and his clerk, Louis H. Oberick, who took turns, both asked Bella pointed questions. Now, the following information is literally quotes from said inquest. Like I said in the beginning of this ordeal, there is a lot of information that has been documented on Belle Gunness and on her situations over the years that survived from the late 1800s and early 1900s until now. Belle described the events of the night. Bella stated that the children were put to bed and that she went to the kitchen to stuff sausage casings from a freshly butchered pig. She stated that Peter had ground the meat for her that afternoon and stated that she completed her task. She washed the meat grinder and Bella stated that she joined Peter in the parlor to read newspapers. Quote, we were sitting here looking at them. I think it was after 11 o'clock. I said to him, I guess it's pretty near time to go to bed. He thought so too and he picked up his pipe and went out to the kitchen. He always used to lock the door before we went upstairs to sleep and I heard him make some little noise out there. And he always put his shoes back of the stove to warm and I guess he must have been back to get hold of a pair of shoes and all at once I heard a terrible noise. I dropped my paper and went and when I came out there he was raising up from the floor and putting both hands on his head. I had a large bowl with some brine on the back of the stove and I was going to put it on some head cheese. I left it there and the bowl was full and hot and I thought I couldn't use it until tomorrow morning and thought I might as well leave it there until morning. Now, while I'm reading through this, you're going to notice that there are going to be a lot of grammatical errors. English was not Bella's first language, and there are times in which she says things that could be said another way. So Bell asked, where was that, on the stove or on the shelf? And Bella answered, on the back part of the stove, I had washed the meat grinder and wiped it off and put it on a shelf of the stove to dry. I generally put my iron things up there to dry. Mama, he says, I burned me so I burned me so terrible. I was so scared I didn't know what to do. All his clothes were wet. I said, you had better take your clothes off. He said, my head burns terribly. I heard baking soda and water was good to put on so it would not get blistered. So I put that on. I bathed the towel in it and put it on his neck. Was all this brine spilt? Bow asked Bella. Yes, I think the bowl was nearly empty. Was the brine boiling hot? Well, it had been boiling, but it had stood for some time on the stove, so it was not so warm, but it was warm enough to burn. I rubbed him with Vaseline and liniment. Bow then moved on to see if Bella had noticed the wound on the back of Peter's head while she was giving him aid on his neck. And Bella agreed that she had noticed the wound. Was it bleeding? Not very much. The bleeding seemed all to be stopped. Bow then prompted Bella to continue with her account of events. And she stated that they were in the kitchen as she had doctored his neck. Quote, he said he was afraid he was going to lose some of his hair on account of all that burning, and he was complaining terribly. Bella stated that they went to the parlor and, quote, sat there a couple of hours anyway. Bella stated that, quote, he was beginning to get a little better, and I said, don't you think you had better lay down? And he said, Probably I will, and I said, you had, not, you had better not go upstairs to bed, but lay down on the lounge. I will fix that up there, for it is warmer. He thought so, and I went and fixed the lounge for him and took off his clothes and put on his nightshirt. 
I told him, I think I'll go up and lay down with the girls, and if there is anything you want, call me down. So I went up and went to sleep. I was tired. Bella then became a little bit more dramatic in her testimony. Quote, All at once, I heard him calling. He was over by the door and calling Mama as fast as he could, and so that the children waked up, and I was trying to think, and said they should keep quiet, that I had to go to Papa, that Papa was burned. I tried to put on my clothes because it was cold. I went down the steps, and when I came down, he was walking around the room saying, Oh, Mama, Mama, my head. I asked him, What is the matter? Was my head my head, he says. It's like something's going on in my head. Papa, I said, What are you talking about? Let me see what it is. I suppose you rubbed off the skin. Oh, my head, my head. Well, if you think it is best, I had better send for the doctor, I said. And I went upstairs and got the girl up, and she went over to the Nicholson's. And when I came from upstairs, he was holding his head saying, Oh, Mama, I guess I'm going to die. I asked him what was painting him so terrible and took him some water. And he said not to touch his head. When Nicholson came to the door, I was rubbing his head, and I opened the door, I think, and they came in. He then thought he was gone, but I didn't, I did not think he was gone before you came. I think he was only unconscious. So that is where I'm going to stop today. <laughs> the inquest goes on much longer and goes into a few more details. As you can tell, Dr. Bao is not completely believing Dear Bella. So with that said, leave your comments in the comment section down below and let me know what you are thinking of this story so far. And do you think that Bella was solely killing for money, or did she love the thrill of the kill? In the description box down below, I will have all of the resources that are numerous in the description box so you guys can go and read more about Belle Gunness. Also, there are four ways to support this channel, Patreon, PayPal, Minds, and Cash App. Also, all my social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and email are down below. So if you have any questions or any requests, you can reach me on one of those. With all that said, guys, I'll see you on the next one.